Hey everybody, Chuck here. Uh, you ever been in a public place and you notice somebody's staring at you? Or have you ever been in a public place and stared at somebody? People say it's rude. You're supposed to tell your kids, don't stare. That's rude. But what's the deal with staring? Turns out we have a podcast episode from November 17th, 2015 called, What's the Deal with Staring? We're going to answer that for you right now. Please enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and guest producer Noel is actually staying in here, I believe. He's staring at us. For this one, he is. As we speak. It's uh, making my cheek blush. Just the one, though. Yeah. Which is weird. It's a tease, is what that is. It's a little bit of a tease. So I'm anything, I'm a big tease. Uh, Spoiler alert. Okay. No, that was it. <laughs> that your cheek is hot. It's a post-spoiler alert. Post. Spoiler. Yeah. I don't know if those work count. I think you can set the internet off into a frenzy if you do it the wrong way. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we've done that before. Oh, yeah. That's right. You say you spoiler say alert beforehand, apparently. Yeah. I thought you just spoiled it and then said, spoiler alert. <laughs> right. As a tag. Yeah. It's not how it works. No. Uh, Chuck. Yes. Have you ever been to the grocery store? Uh... Yeah, I was there yesterday. Were you? Did mm-hmm. you go down this? Do you buy cereal? No, I don't really buy cereal much either. I I um I appreciate cereal. You know, I'm glad it's still around, but I just sure. don't buy it myself. Yeah, but every once in a while, I'll go down the cereal aisle just almost to like visit old friends. Oh, you know? like there's the Count Chocula. Yeah. Exactly. Look, there's uh, Fred uh, Flintstone. What the heck happened to Lucky the Leprechaun? He doesn't look anything <laughs> like he did when we were kids. You know. Look at Tony Tiger. Yes. While, while I'm walking down the cereal aisle, I notice, like, they don't, like, hold my, my gaze like they used to, actually. Because you're not seven. No. Actually, there's this study that found in, I think, to the well, last couple of years at Cornell University. They have, like, a whole food psychology program, you know. Oh, I love that stuff. Um, and they did a study of, like, I think 65 different cereals and found that um, the average gaze, downward gaze, is about a 9.6 degree gaze, right? Of just your normal human walking? No. Um, in the cereal aisle. In the cereal aisle. Okay. So, like, if you were looking at Tony the Tiger and mm-hmm. you were you were me in our normal adult height, he wouldn't be locking eyes with us. But if we were little kids, he'd be looking right into our eyes. Toucan Sam. Toucan Sam, Lucky. All, Captain Crunch, which we've talked about. Yeah, the honeycombs maniac. Yeah, the Goline fiber stick. Sure. <laughs> um, all of those guys, they look into little kids' eyes. And the whole reason why is because um, it builds brand trust and brand loyalty. Yeah. Among um, cereal boxes where the character is looking right into your kid's eyes on the cereal aisle, there's like a 28% brand loyalty compared to like 16% among boxes that don't have little characters looking into your kid's eyes. And it all just kind of goes to show you, like, the, the the stare, even being stared at by a lifeless cardboard cartoon character yeah. is that powerful, that it can, it can make you say, I want to eat what's inside of you. Yeah. You know? Sure. Uh, so the gaze, it's powerful. Or like the, the old days when I was single and I would go into a bar and just like... Go right up beside a lady and just mm-hmm. stare at her face mm-hmm. till she looked at me. Make your eyes as wide as you possibly could. They love that stuff. Sure. Very <laughs> powerful. It shows what a panther you are. A creep is what that would be. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, that's a that's a really great point. Like if it's a leprechaun on a cereal box, you're not threatened or intimidated by it, but there's still some sort of power to its gaze, right? Yeah. If you're another human being, that is so powerful, it has to be wielded very delicately yeah. because people don't like to be stared at as as this this how stuff works article points out it's yeah. simply rude to stare yeah it can be i mean depending on what culture you live in it can be everything from a intimidation tactic to a uh to an affront to like something that's very aggressive right um yeah it means a lot of things around the world but i didn't find a lot of cultures where it was Super nice. No, the closest thing I could find was Argentina being called out um, as it being socially acceptable for men to stare at women. 
in, that doesn't mean that it's, it's written welcomed by an or man. <laughs> right. It's, it's not welcome necessarily or, or wanted, but it's not like a what are you doing kind of okay. thing. But I couldn't find any culture around the world where just outright staring is just normal and fine. Right. It seems to be like it, universally it makes people uncomfortable, it seems like. Yeah, well, this article, uh, we're going to draw from a few, but one from our own website, Why Is It Rude to Stare, which it never really answers, actually. No, it doesn't. It sort of gives some reasons. Danced around it. But um, I did think they made a good point, uh, whoever wrote this early on in the article, uh, that humans ca- are constantly categorizing things when we look around at anything. Right. Uh, from inanimate objects, you know, that desk looks comfortable. Or that chair looks nice. Or <laughs> let me lay down on that desk. That car is cool. Or that person is uh, white. Uh, that person is a woman. Mm-hmm. That person is attractive. That person isn't. Like we're always scanning and dropping things into different mental boxes. Right. And uh, so they make a pretty good point. I think whenever something is just slightly off, um, like that person has one leg, it just the brain has an instinct to to stay, stay on that gaze a little longer right. because it just disrupts the normal, like, that's a thing, that's a thing, that's a thing, and that's different. So let me look at that for a minute. Right. And the, the whole idea behind us walking around constantly scanning our environment is this idea that we've evolved to, at first, I guess, probably hunt for predators. Remember in, like, the gun control episode, we talked about how humans – can um, recognize a gun in the environment as right. readily as recognizing snakes or spiders. Yeah. So we're trained to to pluck stuff out of our environment that Threats. may or may not be a threat. Yeah. yeah. As we've kind of moved away from the possibility of, um, you know, a bear eating you, yeah. typically, it still happens infrequently, but sure. for the most part, we're not threatened by bears, right? Um, we've We've... That, that same ability has kind of moved into this social realm where the, that whole in-group, out-group categorization that we've talked about, too, really kind of comes up. And so we're walking around saying, you're OK, you're all right. You may be a threat, so I'm going to move over here on the other side of the street. Right. I, I don't ne- necessarily recognize you, but we can do all this like pretty quickly, right? Sure. But it's like you were saying, if you see somebody with missing a face – for example, is a good <laughs> is a good one. Yeah. Um, and I read this Wired article that cited a, a woman who basically was like she her husband shot her in the face. And oh man! She walked around before a face transplant, like missing a significant section of the middle of her face. Sure. And she just was stared at all the time. She said she yeah. had to get used to it. I'm sure. Um, this article points out that all you're doing necessarily is taking in more information than you're used to, and we. We do that by staring. It's a result right. of saying there's more info than I can just get through with a quick glance. I need to look at you a little while longer. Right. Uh, and then there was a study at USC, as in Southern California in 2012. This one makes a lot of sense to me because I think what you're doing is you're satisfying a curiosity. Like, um, I guess Oscar Pistorius is a weird example now that he's <laughs> sure, yeah. gone through that thing. Right. But let's say... Pre that, okay. uh, pre that incident, you would see someone like Oscar, Oscar Pistorius and say, wow, I want to see how this guy runs without legs. Right. So I'm going to look at him, put on those blades and, and run. And of course he's a, you know, it's a spectator sport anyway. Right. So, so you can get away looking. with it. Yeah. But I mean, could it happen any day? Like, uh, someone who's handicapped, like, I wonder how they drive a car with no legs. Right. So it's very interesting. So I'm going to look at that. And watch them get in the car and have a specially outfitted car with hand operation. Sure. So it's 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 weird because it's in that case I don't think it's rude, but you're walking a fine line. It, but it is still very rude. Another um, non murderous example, like the second one you gave, yeah, is um uh, there was in this study at USC they used um, women with uh, novel biological effectors, meaning uh, in this case that their arms hadn't fully developed. But they were pr- performing functions that people would normally use their hands for with their re- residual limbs. Right. So someone might be like, wow, how is she painting or exactly. cooking her dinner? Exactly. But at the same time, you're right. You're walking that fine line. So you're staring, but maybe you look away, but then you look back and, and you kind of right. have to take it in in pieces because we are in this weird position where 
we want to take in, but we're also socialized yeah. to not stare as well. It's rude. Well, what they determined in the study, though, which sort of backs up the idea that it is satisfying mm-hmm. a curiosity, is they looked at the brains of people like staring at, uh, let's say, the lady without the formed limbs. And after they looked for a little while, the brain lit up at first, like, oh, my gosh, what am I seeing? This is super interesting. Right. And then the brain normalized and was like, oh, okay, well. That's how she cooks her dinner. That's really neat. Exactly. And then they were able to interact normally after that point. So it's almost like as long as your brain hasn't gotten enough information to its satisfaction, you're not going to feel comfortable. There's going to be something weird and different around it. And if you uh, interact with somebody before you've you've satisfied your brain's need to understand what the heck's going on there, um, then you might not interact with them as comfortably as you would if you... Right. We're able to sit there and take it back. And they did this by having people watch other people through like a one way mirror, I yeah. think, and watch them for a few minutes. Their brains, I guess, became satisfied or figure it out, you know, what the process was. And then after that, they interacted with, with the people much more normally than they did uh, before they were able to fully satisfy their brain's curiosity. Yeah, it's like uh, this might be a pretty lame example, but it's like if you have a huge zit on the end of your nose. Right. And you walk into a group of friends for a meeting, you might say, just get over with. I got this huge zit on my nose. Like Fred Savage in uh, Austin Powers, the (laughs) mole. The mole. Yeah. Like acknowledging it. Hey, I got this huge thing. Instead of being weird about it, just go ahead and take a good gander. Isn't Uh it amazing? Right. And now let's just act normal. And then nine times out of ten, people are like, yeah, great. I just put my hand in front of my face and pretend that nothing's different. (laughs) Is the makeup not working? Right. (laughs) But the thing is, is it's, you know, a zit, you know, you, people have zits themselves. They're sure. fairly well understood and it's transient. You know what I mean? So there is definitely looking at somebody who is differently abled or um, just different in any way. It, it can be considered rude, especially if the, that person has to put up with it again and again. But I think there's just not that understanding of yeah. what is the basis of it. And of course, kids are going to do that. And as parents, you are probably Johnny on the spot by saying, don't stare at that person, that lady without a face. Right. She, You know, it's not nice. Uh, whereas the kid's just thinking, like, I've never seen someone without a face. Right. And the parent, you know, is thinking that same thing, but they're just having to do the parental thing and, you know, like steal a quick glance. Right. And then tell the kid not to stare. Because it's been socialized out of them. Yeah, it's super interesting to me. But it seems to be innate because kids do it, and then they have to be taught not to do it, Right. Yeah. So I wonder almost if it's then in that in that circumstance, if it's like a vestigial trait, Uh, you know, like it's an innate thing that like the kid is responding to the kid's evolutionary history. Right. But it hasn't been socialized to not do that yet. So there's like this social layer that's being put on top of an evolutionary trait. Yeah. So staring seems pretty straightforward so far, right? Actually, it gets way, way more complex. And uh, we will dig into that right after this. So we're back. And we're talking about being stared at, which, by the way, I didn't get a chance to listen to it, but um, Robert and Julie at Stuff to Blow Your Mind did this, did a staring episode a few years back. They had a stare off? Yeah. Who won? Uh, I I bet Julie won. I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Again, I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure they did, though, now that you mentioned (laughs) it. So, um, Chuck, we were talking about staring and how, you know, maybe the evolutionary adaptations to it. And there's a further idea that we've actually evolved, our eyes have evolved to really understand when somebody's looking at us, right? I think it's pretty neat. The gaze detection system? Yeah, they make the point in here. Which article was this from? This one was from Psychology Today. Basically, uh, the difference, the main difference between humans and a lot of animals is with people, you can see a lot more whites of the eye Mm -hmm. than you can with most animals. Right. So the dark parts, uh, that is the parts that look at you, right. uh, you can really tell when those things are moving around. 
Right, exactly. You can tell when you're being looked at a lot more easily. Yeah, so like if the dark parts are in the center of the eye, yeah. roughly you can assume that you're being looked at. Sure. If the dark parts are to the right, the person's looking to the right. If yep. the dark parts are to the left, vice versa, right? Yep, I'm looking at null out of my, I guess you would say, peripheral vision. Exactly. So, and Noel I, I can just, I can relax because <laughs> yeah. you're not looking at me, you're looking at Noel, so I can go back to knitting or sure. starting fires, whatever. Um, but Noel needs to be on his best behavior. And that's actually one of the two, um, suggestions for why we're so responsive to being looked at. Like, there's, there's a couple of things. So with this gaze detection system, they've, they've determined that, um, if you are looking toward me, Chuck. Yeah. But over my shoulder, and I can just kind of tell, right? So your head yeah. is looking at me, your eyes are generally at me, but you're just like a degree or two off. Yeah, like right now. Isn't that weird? Yeah, right now you're, <laughs> it is kind of off-putting. But right now you're setting off a different kind of neuron in my brain yeah. than you are now that you're looking directly at me. Now different neurons are firing. Like specific neurons for when someone is looking right at you fire, which is awesome. E- exactly. Like we have a, basically a region of the brain dedicated to that. Yeah. And I have to say, you and I are like staring at each other way more than normal in this episode. Oh, you think? Oh, yeah. Interesting. Or maybe we're just talking about it more than usual. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, the other cool thing is they, um, you tend in your peripheral vision to notice more when, uh, like, instead of someone just looking at you straight on with their body in their face, mm-hmm. if someone is looking from the side and turning their head completely uh, to the right to look at you, right. that will stand out a lot more in your peripheral vision than someone just standing, staring straight at you. Yeah. Which is super weird. It really is. Today when I was driving in, um, there was this woman walking uh, her baby in a stroller down the street. Yeah. And I was just looking at her kid, and I was driving parallel to her, but my head, I'm sure, was turned toward them. Uh-huh. She wasn't looking anywhere near me. And right. Just all of a sudden, she turns her head and just completely, like, meets my gaze. Yeah. Right? Like, like... She saw somehow, probably in her peripheral vision, uh-huh. that there was somebody in a car looking at her kid. Yeah. And she needed to check it out. So she threw the uh, the cover over the stroller real quick and <laughs> exactly. turned around and went the other way. She's like a monster. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, I find all this stuff fascinating, uh, like whether or not you can feel when you're being stared at directly to your back, let's say. Well, that's something different. So like this, all this um, up to this point... Uh, we've been talking about stuff that can be explained away using like your peripheral vision, noticing other people's body language, um, looking at where the eyes are. Now we're getting into just some weirdness and something called the psychic staring effect or scopesthesia or the feeling that you're being stared at from behind, even though there's no way using your normal senses, you should yeah. be able to tell that someone is looking at you. Yeah. And this, uh, uh, there was a paper, this is from the article, The Feeling of Being Stared At. And there's an old paper from 1898 um, from Science Magazine called The Feeling of Being Stared At by Edward uh, Titchener. Yeah. And he said, and this was sort of a weird feedback loop, but he said, if you go to the front of a room and you have your back to everyone, you're going to feel like you're being stared at. And then you're going to get nervous and start fidgeting around, which mm-hmm. will cause people to stare at you. Yeah. So... Uh, that doesn't do much for me. He also he also said um, it's possible that it's um, when you think someone's staring at you, you start to turn around to see them, to catch somebody staring at you, or to see who it is, and they'll then look at you. Right? They notice you moving, and they start looking at you yeah. before you've made it all the way around. And you say, "See, you were looking like, at me." Exactly. And you say, "No, jerk! I didn't look at you until you turned around and looked at me." Right, and then it just turns into a fist fight every yep. time, every without time. fail. So Tishner basically was like, ah, "It's all illusory. It's it's done." He didn't really write necessarily about all of his methods or study size or anything like that, but um, he he felt like he kind of settled it. Fifteen years later, there was a guy who picked it up again. His name was J.E. Coover. He wrote another paper called The Feeling of Being Stared At. Yeah. And he tried a little more scientifically to figure out what was going on. And he had a pretty cool... I thought his technique was pretty awesome. It was okay. Um, he would sit there and have uh, a study participant with his back to him. And he would roll a dice, a die, and if it came up even... 
he would not stare at them for 15 seconds. Yeah. If it came up odd, he would stare at them for 15 seconds. And then each time the person needed to write down what they thought, whether they were being stared at or not. Yeah, and it was it lined up pretty consistently. Um, but what this uh, points out and what a few of the other staring studies point out is if you know you're in a staring study, uh-huh. you may be more clued in, even if you're blindfolded, to think like, oh, you know, I feel like someone's staring right. because I'm supposed to. Right, exactly. Like you're thinking about being stared. Yeah, exactly. So um, in this J.E. Coover study from 1913, um, he he found that people guessed at about 50%. They were right about 50% of the time, which is even with chance, right? Yeah. So that suggests that you don't really have a sig- uh, the, any kind of signal or sense that you're being stared at. You're just guessing, and you're primed to being guessed. And yeah, like um, follow-up studies have shown that if people are distracted with another task or if they don't think the study's actually about whether or not they're being stared at, they almost never guess that they're being stared at. Yeah. Um, it only starts to show up in studies where you're testing for that sense of being stared at, and they're and primed you know to that. guess. But even then, they're just guessing at about the same rate as chance. So Tishner and Coover and others later on over the years have basically suggested that scopesthesia or that feeling you're being stared at is very widespread. Most people believe that they can tell when somebody's staring at them, but yeah. that it's actually an illusion. Right. That isn't necessarily explained in any of these, but it is It is a widespread illusion that humans tend to suffer from universally. Well, and anecdotally, you might remember the times where I feel like someone's staring at me and someone is, mm-hmm. but not remember the times that you feel like someone's staring at you and you look up and no one's staring. Yeah. Like you don't catalog that. Well, that was another thing they found, too, is that there's no... No one's ever found any any idea that you can tell when you're not being stared at. <laughs> it's just it's just being stared at that we supposedly yeah. have a sense for. All right. Well, let's take another break here, and we'll talk about a few more uh, weird staring studies right after this. All right. All righty. We're back. And here's a weird staring study. Yeah, they've done a lot of them. And this is from an article, The Many Creepy Experiments That Involve Staring at People. On io9. Uh, great website. So this one, um, the stare as a stimulus to flight in human <laughs> subjects was, I thought, pretty interesting and kind of a no-brainer. Uh, basically, they would have someone stand on a corner, and <laughs> then when people would pull up in their car yeah. at the, the light or the stop sign, they would just stare at them in their <laughs> car, and then they would time how long it took them to get the heck out of there when the light turned green. Yeah. And, of course, naturally, they don't even release the, the results. I imagine it was about 100% yeah. that people sped out of there when the light turned green. Yeah, they had a control group that they specifically didn't stare at or yeah. look at, and they definitely left that intersection much more slowly. Yeah, because there's not a creep leering at you yeah. on the sidewalk. Yeah, that's a weird study, but I mean, I guess it added to the scientific body on staring. By 1%. Um, this one, I thought this was interesting because it actually har- harkens back to uh, what Titchener studied, too, was that... There's this weird part of the psychic staring effect where you you physically you can feel like you're being stared at, like the back of your neck gets hot. Yeah. When I was in college, I used to like my scalp would get hot or something, you know, <laughs> like I, I could just I just knew I was being stared at from behind. Um, and this the study found that we we produce some sort of physical effect when we're stared at. Right. Yeah. So they had this, in this particular study, they had um, a psychologist sitting there, I guess, interviewing a person. And then another psychologist would be staring at the person while they were forced to either read out yeah. loud or sing. Yeah, the person being stared at would have to do those things. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for specifying that. And um, the, the, other, the second psychologist would stare like directly at their cheek. <laughs> and the person would blush all over, especially if they were having to sing. But the cheek that was being stared at would blush more. It would get hotter. Like physically, they would measure this. Yeah. It wasn't just anecdotally like 
my right cheek feels hotter. No, and it, it, it's uh, I. No one has any idea how this happens or why this happens, but it's almost like the self consciousness that's produced in being stared at is directed to the specific part of the body that's being looked at. You know, that's very bizarre. That it is that very happens. bizarre. Yeah. Well, because they haven't figured it out. I know. They'll probably isolate something at some point. Yeah, eventually they will. But I mean, like, if you start to compile, like, this body of knowledge on staring, you get the idea that we have a very loose grasp on the effects of staring and what it, what it does and what it signifies and why it's around, you know? Yeah. It's pretty interesting. I always love those episodes. Uh, I do too. There was, uh, uh, this other study I thought was pretty interesting called Gaydar colon. I gaze as identity recognition among gay men and lesbians. And I tried to find a copy. I couldn't find one that I didn't have to pay like 50 bucks for. Mm-hmm. But I did read some summaries. It basically looks into how how gay men and women use a stare to either assess someone's sexuality or to broadcast their own sexuality. Right. And it's not always just a fixed gaze, you know, not some like creepy <laughs> stare, but it was mixed with like body language and looking away uh, and like a flirtation at times. Uh-huh. But uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. It's definitely not just like some heterosexual concept. Right. Um, and staring is not just creepy. It's not just for flirting. They've actually found in other studies that it's a it's a way to um, uh, to ask for help, actually. And it gets results, supposedly. Yeah, this one didn't make a ton of sense to me. So, like, if you spilled some groceries, I think, is what this one study did. Yeah. If you dropped some groceries and you bent over and picked them up, if you just, like, kind of keep to yourself and, like, bend over your groceries and you're looking down at them, and you got it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. In this study, if you look up, though, and are staring at a passerby (laughs) while you're doing this... (laughs) <laughs> they take that as an invitation, if not a directive, to come help them pick yeah. up the groceries, and people respond to that. It's the same thing. Like, think about it. Like, if somebody is in a situation where they could use help, but it's also ambiguous, yeah. like, they kind of got it, but do they really need help? If they're looking at you, they're broadcasting, <laughs> help me. They are. It's just kind of funny, because I'm trying to think. Uh, it just seems like a no-brainer. Like, if I saw a woman in a parking lot who had, like, spilled her groceries and I was walking by, and she looked up right at me as I was passing and picking up. I wouldn't just say, like, how you doing? And <laughs> right. keep going. Bummer, huh? Yeah. Boy, you look like you got it under control. <laughs> like, I would, of course I would stop, but. If she didn't look up. Yeah, maybe I would feel like I'm intruding. Exactly. You know? So, so she that doesn't is, want me putting her hands on her groceries. Right. Uh, and that is, like, a, a, that is one of the theories behind why we're so adept at catching other people's gazes yeah is that it's a it's a means of communicating non-verbally very directly right so so that woman who dropped her groceries or anybody who drops their groceries if they're handling them themselves leave them alone if they're looking up directly at you they're communicating with you they have spilled their groceries and what they're saying is i could use some help with some groceries picking yeah. them up um and that's that that theory behind that the idea that we communicate in in engage in social behavior just from looking is called the cooperative eye hypothesis. And it's basically this idea that... Not a bad band name. Cooperative eye hypothesis. It's a little, little wordy, much, but a little. like I could see like a math rock band. It's no Kathleen Turner Overdrive. <laughs> Maybe the best band name of all time. Yeah. Um, but this this whole thing is that we, we are able to communicate, um, not just that we need help, yeah. but also we tend to follow one another's gaze. If one person's looking off in the distance and clearly looking at something not zoned out, yeah, yeah, people are going to look over there, and it's basically the same thing as like a herd of gazelles looking over at what oh, this sure. one gazelle on high alert is suddenly looking at. Yeah, you want to you want to have some fun? Go to New York City or any city, yeah, and just with one other person, and just go stand and both look up and stare at something, and then just sit back. Well, you can't sit back, but have a friend sit back and watch. How many people, and in New York, of course, they won't stop and look, but everyone that passes you by will look up and say, what in the world are these two people looking at? Yeah. What are you looking at? Yeah. What's up there? Are you, you, you staring at nothing? You just don't say anything. <laughs> and then a game of telephone will break out. People will just start making up what's up there. Yeah. And then it becomes a, uh, what do you call it? When people all get together and dance at one time somewhere? Flash mob. Flash mob. Yep. 
That's an organic flash mob. Yeah, you just have a bunch of people staring. Um, it's a very boring flash mob. I got one more. All right. The idea that um, being aware of being stared at is basically keeps us in line. The idea that we're being stared at or watched. Oh, it makes you behave? Yeah. Another socially, pro-social motivation. Um, and I got another grocery store example. I was at the grocery store yesterday. Yeah. And uh, I was walking in the parking lot, and this woman had her cart. And I noticed her, like, looking around. And she was about to leave her cart right there in the parking lot next to her. And she uh. saw me looking at her, and she, like, just suddenly went and walked it over to the cart corral. Uh-huh. I could tell by her movement she was not planning on going to the cart corral until she saw me watching her. Yeah. And then she took it to the cart corral. I'm like, yes. Shame. Exactly. You engage in more ethical behavior if you think you're being watched. And yeah. that would explain why we're so we're such a social species. Sure. And the just having that heightened awareness that you're being watched is possibly part of that. Yeah, that's uh, one of my couple of big rules in life that are meaningless to most people. But always return your cart. Yeah. Don't oh, be you one wanna... of those people like, oh, they pay people to go around and get the carts. It's because they have to, <laughs> right? Because of you. And the other thing is, uh, always throw your uh, movie theater uh, popcorn and drinks away on your way out. Oh yeah. The people that just get up and leave the movie theater with their popcorn bag and their drink there. Mm-hmm. It's pretty eighties. Play- yeah, I just don't get it. Like th- those are those. Are, I'm just going to go and say it. Those are the worst people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to become canonized, Chuck. Yeah. Not only should you return your cart, you can do the opposite and take a cart from somebody so they don't even have to take it back if you're on your way in. Yeah, I've done that. That's that's the same saint level stuff. I rarely use the big cart though. I'm I'm I do a lot of daily grocery shopping. Yeah. It's I a good way to go. It's very Dutch. Is it? According to the stuff for the next article it is. Yeah. Well I wear my wooden clogs and ride my bicycle. <laughs> Very astute of you. Thank you. Uh, you got anything else? You know what? This just reminded me. I did have one slight more thing. Uh, you've heard of vitiligo, um, mm-hmm. what Michael Jackson had, sure. the skin condition where parts of your skin are lighter than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, I posted on Facebook there was this uh, young woman who has vitiligo on her arms, and she finally just got a tattoo and lovely script on her forearm that said, it's called vitiligo. Awesome. And I posted about this, and then she apparently listens to the show, and she posted, thanks for sharing this, guys. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, I thought it was kind of neat. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear from people that have, uh, I can't remember what they call them in the studies, novel. Um, novel biological effectors. Right. Basically, you know, something unusual physically mm-hmm. that people might be prone to stare at. Yeah. I want to hear from people and how you deal with that or if you've gotten used to it mm-hmm. or if you think it is super rude or if you're like, yeah, I would stare at me, too. Yeah, but that is a great call out. Yeah. Um, and we'll, let's see listener mail, and then we'll hit it up again. All right. Uh, hola todos. My name is Amy, and I'm an English teacher living abroad in Malaga, Spain. Uh, I'm a recent fan and only discovered your podcast when I was desperate for something to listen to on the metro rides. That's between... how everybody comes to us. <laughs> yeah, out of desperation. <laughs> uh, the first podcast I listened to was How Nazis Invaded Florida, and I haven't stopped downloading uh, now, the real reason I'm sending the email is a little strange. I teach many adult classes. My students are always asking how they can practice listening to native speakers. Uh, many people don't know that in Spain, all of the American or English TV series or movies are dubbed. I did not know that. In Spanish voiceover. I didn't know that either. I figured like a high percentage would be, but not all of them, you know? Yeah. Uh, so there isn't, uh, aren't many options to practice listening skills. Uh, once I got addicted to your show, I started suggesting that my higher level students listen to you guys as well. Honestly, didn't think many of them would actually go home and start listening. However, I was wrong. And this is in all caps. Every single one of them are now addicted like me. That's so awesome. And then back to regular, non-all caps. Yeah. So thanks, guys. Uh, <laughs> my students want me to send an email to say thank you for speaking slow, but not too slow, and using a vocabulary that makes uh, any topic of science, astrophysics, biology, and history easy to understand. I've noticed a big change in their listening skills and even have uh, the entertainment of teaching some puns and slang that you both say on the show. It makes class much more enjoyable. The only bad side is now they want a tour of the U.K. 
so we can all come to see you guys live. That's so cool. See, everybody in the United States, oh, you guys aren't coming to St. Louis. I can't possibly come see you. People are talking about traveling from Spain to England to see us. Seriously. Come on. Don't go to Milwaukee. I'm in Madison. Right. <laughs> uh, keep on shelling out this podcast. And gracias por todo. Hasta luego. Amy Culver. Amy, thank you for that. I love that email. That's Me a too. great email. Uh, hasta la vista to your class. Thank you very much for writing in. Um, and uh, that's wonderful. Hope you guys keep listening. We're known for our slang, aren't we? Get on the trolley, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, that old thing. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us to say hi uh, in another language, that's cool. But like Chuck said, we want to hear from you if you have a uh, novel biological effector and get stared at and what you do in dealing with that. Um, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to StuffPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.